Okay, uh, thanks everyone for coming. Uh, yes, it's nice to see uh, a, a few familiar faces in the room. Um, for those of you who haven't met me before, uh, my name's Tim Foster. Uh, I used to work at Water for Food as a postdoc for around a year and a half. Um, I'm now based at the University of Manchester uh, in the UK. Um, one of the things I work quite a lot on is the development of this Aquacrop OS model, um, something that we've been working on with people here at Water for Food, so Nick Brozovich and Christopher Neal, for those of you who know uh, folks here at Water for Food, as well as people at FAO and at Imperial College in London. Um, so basically what we are going to be doing today is trying to give you an introduction to the model, uh, looking at providing some practical examples of how you can use the model to understand yield response to water, and then we're going to be thinking about some of the applications of model outputs, both from Aquacrop OS and other types of crop models, how they can be used uh, to support agricultural water management decision making. So we've basically got quite a long day penciled in. Um, we've got quite a few breaks stacked within it, and we may try and finish up a little bit earlier than 5.30, depending on how long it takes us to get through the exercises. But what we're going to do for the first hour, hour and a half is just try and give you, we, we have limited time, so we're not going to be able to go into a huge amount of detail about specific equations and uh, specific aspects of the coding and model, but just going to try and give you a really high level overview of what the model is, how it works, what some of the inputs are that you need, what some of the outputs are that it produces, and then go through a sequence of sort of three or four exercises to try and just get you using the model, um, and again, really focusing on use of the model for quantifying uh, crop yield response to water. So this first uh, session, what we're basically going to do is start, I'll think a little bit about why we might want to understand crop yield response to water. This is probably going to be quite obvious information for a fair few people in the room. Some of you may be less so. Um, why crop models are an important or useful tool for that purpose. And then going to get into a little bit of detail about exactly how Aquacrop OS works. Um, again, some of the inputs that are required, some of the outputs that can be generated. We then have a bunch of USB sticks here which have a copy of the code on it along with some other documentation and stuff um, that we hope you'll find useful. So we'll be giving those out and just doing a check that everyone's got a laptop and if they've got a laptop that they've got whatever software they need to run the model set up and if you haven't got a laptop we have got a few spares um, that people can use at the back um, or if you have any problems getting the right software to get it working we can help you with that. That's kind of what we're trying to get through in the first sort of hour, hour and a half. Um, I kind of like when I start thinking about crop modeling to particularly around thinking about yield response to water with start off thinking about the question of why why do we actually irrigate? Um, again, a blindingly obvious question, probably the majority of people in this room, but this sort of data kind of nicely highlights the value that irrigation provides. So this is just data I pulled out of the NAS database, the USDA database, just showing irrigated corn yields in Chase County, which is in southwest Nebraska. Um, and basically the takeaway point is the difference between the blue line, which is irrigated crop yields, and the red line, which is dry line crop yields. So you can see that irrigation basically serves the purpose of allowing farmers to buffer production against year-to-year -year variability in rainfall and other types of weather conditions, and also just generally that in many parts of the world we're growing crops in semi-arid and arid conditions where there simply just isn't enough water available to meet uh, crop water requirements. We obviously have a big problem in many areas of the world in that we have growing problems of water scarcity that are placing significant constraints on agricultural production. So most people in this room are pretty familiar with a figure like that of the High Plains Aquifer. On the left hand side showing how much groundwater has been depleted over the past 50 or 60 years ago. So in the High Plains, some places like Texas were sort of at 75% depletion. It's obviously having big implications for irrigated agriculture. India is obviously another example. So we can see that in many parts of India, we have level of agricultural water withdrawals that are 100% of renewable water supply or even greater than 100%. So those were just two examples that I pulled out, but we could really think about that in pretty much any country around the world where we have 
major irrigated agriculture, we tend to see problems of unsustainable water use, uh, which threatens future food security. Mm -hmm. So that kind of gets into the thing of, well, if we think about what we need to do and also think about what the mission is of somewhere like the Water for Food Institute, it's really around how can we produce more food in future years whilst having less pressure on water resources. And if we're going to do that, one of the first things we need to be able to understand is we need to understand how crop yields actually respond to irrigation water inputs. So we can do that in a number of ways. We can go out and we can run field experiments. So we can run experiments for different levels of irrigation treatments and see how crop yields respond. Problem is that takes us a very long time to do. If we want to capture lots of climate conditions, lots of soil conditions, maybe lots of different crop types and irrigation treatments, we might have to run field experiments for five, ten, even more years, which is a long time to wait for that kind of, kind of data and inputs. So what we tend to do is we tend to instead use crop simulation models. So we run a small number of field experiments, we calibrate a mathematical model of the crop soil uh, atmospheric uh, system, and then we use that model to run lots and lots and lots of simulations for different climates, soil conditions, management practices, water supply conditions, all trying to quantify crop yield response to water very quickly, so in the space of a few minutes rather than the space of several years, um, and then use that to inform decision making around agricultural water management. So we're going to be talking quite a lot about crop water production functions in today's workshop. That term will be familiar to some people here. A crop water production function is basically just a mathematical relationship of seasonal irrigation versus. Excuse me, crop yield. Come on, squeeze past that. <laughs> yeah. We're uh, in a bit of a tight space. I think we have a few people who are going to be dropping in and out during today's session, so hopefully we'll have a little bit of space freed up as we go through, and we can also bring in another table at the front once we get into the exercises. So this is really what we're going to be focusing on, how we use crop simulation models to generate this kind of output. So this kind of output of this response of yield to water is really what we need for a number of purposes. It's useful for farmers if they want to decide, I've got so much water, which crop should I use that water on and how much water should I apply, what level of deficit irrigation should I do. If we look at how that production function changes between different types of management practices, we can see how we might potentially benefit uh, from adopting those management practices if we have limited water availability. And it's also going to be useful for decision makers at larger scales, people who are interested in, say, if we know the crop water production function of lots of different farmers across a landscape, if we introduce a policy to, say, restrict agricultural water use to some quota, how is that going to impact people across an agricultural <coughs> landscape? Is it going to be beneficial in terms of improving rural economies and uh, water resource sustainability? And what's the optimal way we should allocate water both across space and time to different producers, uh, different uses? <coughs> so getting into Aquacrop OS now, so <coughs> what is it? So Aquacrop OS is a free open source version of Aquacrop, which was a crop water productivity model developed by uh, FAO, which is a UN agency. They developed it around, I think the first version came out in around 2009. Um, we're now at version five. Version six will be coming out uh, in two, three months time, and we'll have a version six of the open source version following on shortly after that. If people are interested, I can tell you a little bit more about what will be changing in version six in one of the breaks. Basically what the model does is it simulates the yield response to water of different types of annual herbaceous crops. So it's not looking at perennial or tree crops, it's focusing on annual crops. There's quite a diverse bank of different crops that have been calibrated. So we have calibrated <coughs> uh, inputs for things like uh, maize, wheat, sorghum, soybean, cotton, a variety of other crops. And it can work also across a diverse range of climate conditions and management practices. And it differs a little bit from a number of the other crop models that are out there. Um, so we, there's a lot, we all know there's tons and tons of different crop models out there. There's AppSim, there's DSAT. Aquacrop's selling point is really that it requires significantly less data inputs 
than many of those other crop <coughs> models, while still being a robust and accurate model that captures this sort of key uh, soil water budgeting and crop physiological concepts uh, within the model. Some of the advantages that AquaCrop OS brings in is that it allows us to run very large batch simulations on, if we have access to some kind of cluster or server, we can run very large simulations if we want to consider, say, the whole of the High Plains aquifer. We can also very easily, it provides an easy way of linking the model with other tools. So say we want to link it to an economic model of farmer decision making, or we want to link it to a groundwater model to study how changes at the field level are going to impact water resources <coughs> at larger catchment or regional levels. We'll be giving you a copy of the code. If you want to at some point, or need to at some point, download a, an additional version of it, you can basically just go to the website and you fill in a form, and then it will send an email to me, and then I will try and respond as quickly as I can to then send you the code. There's sometimes a bit of a lag depending on whether I'm traveling or uh, on holiday, which is a rare occurrence nowadays. But, uh, so we've had, we released the code back in so towards the end of August, early September last year. We've had f nearly 300 people now download it um, from around 60 countries around the world. Uh, so we have quite a few users in Europe and uh, the United <coughs> States, but also across places in Africa uh, and Asia as well. And then really what I want to spend the majority of this session talking about is exactly how the model works and what it does. So that I've thought about how really to distill what's a pretty long, complex set of code that goes on for several thousand lines into something that I could explain to people in 45 minutes or so. It really splits into four main steps. So we have how the model simulates crop growth and yield development when we have no water stress conditions. So when there's lots of water in the soil and we don't have any limitations from water availability. We're then also simulating a separate soil water balance at the same time and then accounting for the feedbacks between that soil water balance and crop growth through water stress effects. And then the model is also considering another number of other types of environmental stresses like temperature and fertility and salinity that we'll get into in a bit more detail towards the end. I should say, please feel free to ask questions as we go along or at the end as you feel uh, would be preferred for you. So when we're talking about sort of non-limiting conditions, so when there's no water stress, there's no fertility stress, just how the crop would grow under perfect conditions, aqua crop is basically dividing up the simulation into four main steps. So we're looking at crop development, crop transpiration, biomass production, and then yield formation. So we're going to go through each of those in turn. So the crop development part of aqua crop is basically considering how the crop grows above ground, so how the canopy of the crop expands above ground and the production of biomass, and also how the root system develops below ground in the soil. So in terms of the canopy development, this is where aquacrop diverges a little bit from a number of the other crop models that are in the literature. A lot of crop models use leaf area index as their way of modeling canopy development. Aquacrop doesn't actually use leaf area index. It models canopy cover in terms of green canopy cover. So green canopy cover is effectively the proportion of the soil surface covered by the canopy. So if we look down vertically, what proportion of the soil surface is shaded by the canopy over the unit ground surface. So that number is going to vary from zero at the start of the season when the canopy cover, the crop is yet to be seeded and there's no canopy that's developed, up to a value of one if the canopy is fully closing over the soil conditions. And we'll see why that's important as we go through. I just pulled off these couple of images um, which are actually showing visual overheads of a corn crop at different points in its development. So we have here, canopy covers probably around about 50%. Um, it's, I don't take that as an accurate number, that's just my estimation. And then probably around 90% on the right hand side. The main motivating factor towards going towards canopy cover rather than leaf area index was it's very easy to go out into the field and take an image like that and visually estimate canopy cover and also very easily estimate it from remote sensing as well. So it provides uh, a quick and accessible source of data for calibrating the model. And basically, when we have those non-limiting conditions, the model is 
calculating canopy cover on a daily time step, so actual crop is a daily time step model, using just a very small number of input parameters. So in the early part of the growing season, we basically need to tell the model a few things. We need to tell it what the time is from when we sow the crop or transplant the crop, if it's a crop that we're transplanting rather than sowing, to the time when we get the maximum canopy cover development occurring. We then have to specify this initial canopy cover size, CC0, which is just a function of the density of planting. And then we have this parameter, CGC, which is a, a growth coefficient. So it's how fast does the canopy grow per calendar day or per growing degree day. And then we basically have a logistic equation that describes how canopy cover expands up to its maximum level um, at the midpoint of the growing season. And then we have canopy cover at its maximum size, and then towards the end of the growing season, we just have to have a few more input parameters. So we have to say, how long is it going to take until senescence kicks in, and what's the time to maturity? And then we have a canopy decline coefficient, which is the same. It's how fast does the canopy decline per calendar day or per growing degree day? So we can see we've got about five or six parameters there that we have to provide as inputs for the crop that we're modeling, and that then describes how the canopy develops over the growing season. What is exactly the time? Is it so time, nominal time or? So time can be two things. You can run the model as a calendar day model. So you can run it on saying it's 50 days to maximum canopy cover, or you can run it on growing degree day mode. So it's in sort of thermal time mode. Is a daily time step? Yeah. So it's recommended that you run the model in thermal time mode if you can, because obviously that's uh, a more accurate way of expressing how long the crop's going to take to reach different <coughs> stages in its development. Um, if you're working in, say, developing world countries, it may be that there isn't data available to calculate uh, thermal time equivalents, so you may have to use calendar day times. You can very easily switch between the two uh, in the model. So that's how canopy develops. The other bit that we said was we're also considering how the root zone develops below ground. So again, just a small number of parameters required. You have to say what the initial depth of the root zone is at the start of the growing season. You have to say what the maximum effective rooting depth is and how long it takes us to get there. And then we just have a, another one of those sort of shape type parameters that's just how fast is the root zone expanding per unit of time, whether it's thermal or calendar. And it's just going to follow that kind of uh, roughly linear but slightly off linear, depending on your shape parameter here, uh, expansion curve through the growing season. So that's kind of what's happening in the first step where we're thinking about crop development. That's the sort of first thing that the model does on, on each day of the simulation. Once it's done that, we then move on to calculating transpiration rates. So the transpiration rate in agricrop basically depends in, on two things. It depends on the reference ET value for that day, so ET naught. So for anyone who isn't familiar with what reference ET is, reference ET is basically the evaporating power of the atmosphere, which depends on climatic factors like temperature and wind speed. So when it's very hot, very windy, we're going to have higher evaporating power of the atmosphere. And it's standardized for a reference grass crop surface. And then we have this Kc term here, which is the crop coefficient. That's basically the, representing the differences between our crop that we're modeling on the current day and our reference grass crop surface. So in terms of their sort of transpiring capacities, how do those two differ? And that's represented through that KC value. Cool. A, uh, there's a term I remember from years ago called pan evaporation. Yeah. Is this is this similar or how would this how would the reference evaporation be different from pan evaporation? So the reference evaporation is a pan evaporation is just assuming a sort of flat water surface. Mm -hmm. So reference evaporation is actually assuming some kind of vegetated surface. So it's evaporating through the grass into the atmosphere. Yeah, exactly. Um, so mixture of soil evaporation and transpiration. And obviously because of the different resistances between a open water surface and a grass canopy, you get slightly different rates of uh, 
reference CT okay. in this sense. So we're basically, the reason we use a reference grass surface is because otherwise we'd have to calculate a different reference ET in a completely different way for every different type of crop that we want to consider. So we want a standardized input that's just dependent on climatic factors um, and removing the effects associated with the specific characteristics of the vegetation surface. So the KC value is the difference, as I said, between that reference surface and our crop, but it's also basically proportional to the size of the canopy cover. So early in the growing season, when the canopy is very small, KC will be very small, and therefore transpiration will also be very small. As the canopy expands, KC will become larger, therefore transpiration will become larger, assuming that there's enough water in the soil to satisfy that demand. So once we've simulated transpiration, we then want to calculate how much biomass has the crop produced above ground, so we're just talking about above ground biomass here. We basically see that there is a link between transpiration and biomass production. So what you can see is basically happening is the crop takes up water from its root system, it moves that water up through the stems of the plant and out to the leaves, and then that, that's released as water vapor through the stomata or those little pores in the leaves of the plant. At the same time, you have water vapor going out, you have carbon dioxide coming in. That carbon dioxide is then converted through the process of photosynthesis into carbohydrates, and they basically form the building block of biomass production. And what we basically see when we do experiments in the field is we see that the relationship between, uh, the relationship between transpiration and biomass production is effectively falls roughly along a linear line. So we have a linear relationship between transpiration and biomass production, and if we were to plot that, the slope of that line, so the proportional factor relating the two, is basically known as the water productivity of that crop. So we can basically say that biomass is equal to transpiration <coughs> multiplied by the water productivity of the crop. One of the problems is that that water productivity parameter not only varies by crop type, but it also varies by based on climatic conditions. So we get a different slope of that relationship for maize if we look in, say, southwest England versus in southwest Nebraska. So the way we get around that is aquacrop uses what's known as this normalized water productivity parameter, so WP star. And the normalization basically works by we divide the transpiration rate by the reference ET on each day. So that division by reference ET basically allows us to normalize the water productivity value for climate conditions. There's also some normalization of this parameter that goes on for the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. If we have higher CO2 concentrations, we get more biomass production per unit of transpiration. I won't go in, it's a little bit more complicated how that is done, so I won't go into specific to that now, but I have really talked to people about it in uh, one of the breaks. Basically, we see... Oh, excuse me. Uh, can yep. you go back to this? So basically, it's not the, it's the absolute transpiration rate. It's the ratio. Exactly. Yeah. yeah um, and that's how we... End. So basically, the reason that's done is that then we can have a... When we look at the data, we find that when you do that normalization, the water productivity value of, say, maize is actually very similar across lots of different environments around the world. So this was one of the points of the model was that it was trying to make a model that could be relatively quickly applied to lots of different crops, but also lots of different areas around the world where there may be limited data availability. <coughs> and what we basically find is that that water productivity value, the normalized one, you get it falling into roughly two main categories. So you have C3 type crops that are things like wheat, where we have a, tend to find a value of around between 15 and 20 grams per meter squared. And then we have C4 crops, which are things like maize fall into that category. Uh, so we get this division between the two in terms of how easily those crops are able to convert uh, transpiration into biomass production. So and then I said that there was a sort of fourth and final step in the model Obviously, our above-ground biomass is 
all the above ground biomass is created. So the leaves, the stems, flowers, any grains that are forming if it's a grain crop. Only a proportion of that is stuff that we actually harvest and say if we're thinking about economic returns we can actually sell for uh, a decent rate and gain income on. So we then need to convert that biomass production into our harvestable yield. So we do this using this harvest index parameter, so it's just simply the biomass production at the end of the growing season multiplied by this harvest index parameter. And this harvest index parameter basically evolves over the growing season and the way it evolves is a little bit different depending on the type of crop that we're modeling. So the model is basically breaks crops down into three categories. So you have fruit or grain crops, so again maize would fall into that category, where at the start of flowering we start to see harvest index build up at a sort of lag rate and then we eventually get a sort of linear increase over time and we're basically increasing to what's known as this reference harvest index value, which is again a, an input that we need to provide for the crop that we're modeling. For something like potatoes that are a root or tuber type crop, we have a sort of more logistic type curve that's used to model how harvest index develops over the growing season and we're starting at tuber formation rather than at flowering for that type of crop. And then for leafy vegetable crops, so things like lettuce, uh, where again logistic type curve but the harvest index is starting to build up right at the point that the crop starts to germinate, so it's not happening part way through the growing season. That's basically how the, in the four steps that the model takes for simulating crop growth and yield development. So we end up with that final value of yield that is dependent on our canopy cover, which feeds into transpiration, into biomass production, and then multiplied by our harvest index gives us our yield. That was all assuming that on every day of the growing season, we have lots of water in the soil. There's no limiting conditions from water availability. Obviously, in a lot of cases, that's not going to be true. So at the same time as simulating crop growth, the model is also simulating a simple soil water balance. So some of this may be familiar to people here. So basically, we need to just uh, specify a few properties of the soil that allow us to simulate both the availability and the movement of water in the soil profile. And basically, we need to say, what. Well, what is the water content of the soil at saturation? What is it at field capacity? So field capacity is the water that the soil can hold against forces of gravity. So any water above field capacity will drain down through the soil profile. Water at field capacity or below won't drain vertically downwards. Um, <coughs> Trenton might take issue with whether that's actually the case in the field. Um, and then we have the water content at wilting point, which is basically the lowest level of water content that the plant is able to still take up water. So any water at wilting point or below can't be accessed by the plant. And then we also have to tell it what, what is the saturated hydraulic conductivity of the soil. So how easily does the soil transmit water um, vertically downwards? Uh, basically how permeable is the soil? And these are all a function of the type of soil that we're considering. So we see that if we have a very sandy soil, we have very low field capacity, very low wilting point, there's quite a narrow range of water that is actually available to the plant and that can be held against gravity. Those soils also have very, very high hydraulic conductivities. So they'll transmit water very, very easily. Opposite being something like a clay soil that has much higher field capacity, much higher wilting points, also not terribly high water holding capacities, but also very, very low hydraulic conductivity, doesn't transmit water very easily. And then we have loamy soils that are kind of in the middle. They transmit water quite well, but they also have relatively high field capacities and slightly lower wilting points, which means they hold quite a lot of water um, and potentially, therefore, are going to be uh, more effective at buffering against periods of drought than, say, a sandy soil would be. And what Equicop's doing is basically on a daily step, so simultaneous to the simulation of crop development, it's performing a water balance in the soil profile. And for simplicity, we're just going to consider the soil to be a bit like a sort of single reservoir here. The model is actually dividing the soil up into 
12, maybe even 15 different reservoirs <coughs> that can cascade and interact with each other, but just for simplicity, let's think of it as one reservoir. You have inflows from rainfall and any irrigation that you might choose to apply, and you have potentially inflows from capillary rise from a groundwater table if you have a shallow groundwater table, and then you have outflows from evapotranspiration, and potentially you have outflows from deep percolation. So basically what happens is if you get consistent periods where rainfall and irrigation exceed evapotranspiration, so exceed, exceed the water demands of the crop, your amount of stored water will go up. If it goes up above field capacity, that water will start to drain down through the soil profile <coughs> and you'll get deep percolation out of the base of the soil profile. <coughs> if you have no rainfall and irrigation, then basically what's going to happen is you're going to start to build up a deficit in the soil and the water content's going to dry out. I'm going to see how that will feed into uh, estimation of water stress effects in the model. So I I guess, did you have a question? I did, uh, so yeah. the K theta relationship, is that linear? You didn't parameterize the shape of that? No, so it's not a Richards equation right. type model. Um, so it's, yeah, it's basically a single value and then there is an equation that relates that to the water content, but it's not quite the same as okay. a physics-based Richards equation model. All right. um, for those of you who do some soil water modeling, there are alternative approaches for modeling. This basically treats the soil as sort of a series of cascading reservoirs. You can also have a physically based approach that uses, that models uh, soil water flow based on what's known as Richard's equation. We are actually looking to develop a version of Aquacrop that gives you the option to either use a Richard's equation approach that's similar to something like Hydrus, um, or this cascading reservoir approach that people can pick between the two different approaches. So the flux at saturation and at field capacity is the same? Then? No, so there is an equation, uh, there's an sort of exponential equation Excellent. that okay. relates. So you need another coefficient. You do. You the have to, it's, co it's called tau in the input files that relates the wa where the water content is between field capacity and saturation okay. via the high saturated conductivity. And the lower boundary condition for capillary rise, yeah. would you use them for that? Similar, it's sort of there's an exponential equation with a couple of parameters that so relate below to the, the your depends how the, so below your root zone though you're assuming it's saturated or what are you assuming that no so you specify the depth of right what's the water content below that depth though yes yeah, so there is a degree of interpolation between okay. the two uh, again that will be something that I think we can make better in the future with okay. building in an actually physically based uh, unsaturated flow model to that. So yeah, that's actually an important point. Aquacrop is not actually simulating changes in the groundwater table. You have to specify the depth of the groundwater table as an input, but with the open source code, one of the things that you can do is link the model to a groundwater model that will allow you to, on a daily time step, provide an updated value of the depth of the water table. And then there are two or three parameters that relate and interpolate that depth uh, in terms of the water content obviously being saturated at the water table and partially saturated at the base of the root zone. So that's how the model is dealing with the soil water balance. And we sort of saw that if we get outflows exceeding inflows, then we're going to get a deficit building up in the soil profile. And that deficit is basically what we use to decide whether there's water stress effects occurring and then relating those to uh, crop development. So the model basically has three main stress thresholds at which different types of crop development will be impacted by water stress. So if we get a deficit that builds up that drops below this initial threshold here, what basically starts to happen is that the model will start to slow if we're still in the early period of canopy development, so if the canopy hasn't reached its maximum size, at this point the model would start to slow down the rate of canopy expansion. So what you basically see is if that stress threshold is exceeded on any given day, then we end up with a profile that looks a bit like this. So under non-stress conditions we build up to our maximum value and then we decline at the end. In this condition 
we're building up much slower because water stress has slowed down the rate of canopy expansion. In some cases, it might not be that severe and we just reach the maximum value at a later time than we would do if there hadn't been any water stress. In some cases, it may be more extreme in that we never actually get to the maximum value. We hit the end of the vegetative growth period before we've reached maximum canopy size because we've slowed down the rate of canopy expansion so much. So that's kind of the first stress threshold that can be triggered. If we lower the water content in our root zone a little bit further, so we build up a larger deficit, the second thing that kicks in is closer closure of the stomata, so closure of those pores on the leaves of the crop that control the outflow of water for transpiration. So you can kind of imagine what kind of effect this has. If we have non-stressed conditions, we're going to have our daily rate of transpiration varying because of the changes in reference CT, the changes in the size of the canopy. But then we get a depressed amount of transpiration because our stomata are being closed in the model, so reducing transpiration rates because of increasing water stress. Obviously within this, there's also the effect of we've got a smaller canopy size, therefore we're going to get less transpiration because we saw the canopy cover feeds into the transpiration rate by changing the crop coefficient on each day of the season. The other thing that when we trigger this second stress threshold happens is that our root zone also starts to expand in the model at a slower rate. And I'll explain a little bit in a in a few slides time exactly how we scale each of these crop growth processes in the model. The implication of this being that if we have a shallower root zone, we're probably also going to be more likely to have further water stress later in the growing season because we're going to be tapping a smaller proportion of the potential water that might be available in the soil. We've got a smaller area as well to store water uh, for potential dry periods later in the growing season. But it um, if the stress is so severe that it, yeah, you did end up in such kind of a situation that uh, the root depth is severely limited. But uh, in reality, of course, we know that uh, for a mild water stress, the root depth can even be kind of stimulated because the roots basically try to expand its area or the volume for water exploitation and say that. How is this one is considered in the model, or it's not considered? So at the moment, it's not considered the ability of the roots to say continue to expand even in mild to moderate water stress. It is one of the updates that's being brought in in the next version. One of the things we found a little bit with aquacrop is if we get very very severe water stress early in, or moderate to severe water stress early in the growing season, compared to field data, the model does have a tendency to over exaggerate how the crop might the negative impacts on crop growth um, and that's motivated some of the updates that have been brought in in the next version to try and correct for that effect and avoid the crop dying off very quickly early in the growing season um, and I think that was definitely part of the effect is that the root zone ex expansion slows down too much and should be allowed to continue to expand um, or potentially even expand at a faster rate in response to that stress. But obviously then if we push the model a little bit further, we get to a sort of third stress threshold where we've almost dropped the water content now and the soil down to wilting point. We've almost completely taken away all the water that is available to support crop growth. And basically what's gonna happen at this point is we're gonna cause the crop to start to senesce and the canopy to start to decline earlier than it would have otherwise done if there hadn't been water stress. So we kind of see a similar, we saw a similar <laughs> image to this before. Now what's happening is we're just terminating growth much earlier in the growing season because we caused the crop to die off earlier than it otherwise would have done. And that's again going to have a number of implications in that we've basically shortened the growing season quite substantially one of the big effects that has is that our harvest index is not going to develop to its maximum value, so we're going to get low, less harvestable yield. We also have a significantly shorter amount of time available for crop transpiration to occur and for biomass to develop. If we get this effect occurring once we're already in the canopy decline stage, 
the effect is basically that the canopy will just decline faster than it otherwise would have done if there wasn't any water stress. So those are kind of the three different types of stress threshold that the model considers. There, are all, there is some additional effects on the harvest index. It's a little bit more complicated because it integrates four or five different types of stress responses. So I'll cover that after this. What I was basically saying is that when we have, when we go below those thresholds, we're basic, what the model basically does is it adjusts different parameters controlling different growth processes. So say for that first threshold, the parameter we're adjusting is that CGC parameter, so that canopy growth coefficient. And we adjust it basically by calculating these stress coefficients, this value of this KS value. So we have a different KS value for different type of stress effect. And the size of KS is basically between 1 and 0. So when we're, our water content is above the level that stress will be triggered, KS is basically equal to 1. And if we multiply, say, CGC by 1, the parameter just doesn't change and we get crop growth occurring as it would do under non-limiting conditions. And then we have a lower threshold, which is where KS is equal to 0, where we basically completely shut off that growth process or completely shut off transpiration. And we basically have a continuum here between the two where as we reduce from the upper threshold to the lower threshold, so as we increase our deficit, the stress level is going to increase in size uh, and severity. And you can kind of pick exactly how this is parameterized. There is, but you basically have to tell it the model, what is the upper threshold? What is the lower threshold in terms of water contents? And then how sensitive is the crop within the, that range? So for some crops, we might have very low sensitivity and you only get decline when you're getting very close to the lower threshold. In others, it might start to happen almost instantaneously. So an input parameter to the model is a shape parameter that basically describes the shape of that curve. And those parameters are basically specific to the type of crop that is being developed. So you, they're the sort of things that should transfer well across different types of geographic locations, although you might need to adjust it, say, if you were looking at a more drought tolerant cultivar. Is there a lead in on the water stress? Pardon? Is there a lead in? On yeah, the so. On the water stress? I haven't actually mentioned the wet end, partly because I thought we might run short on time a little bit. In addition to the sort of negative impacts of having not enough water, there is also a threshold for having too much water. You basically, <coughs> if you're between saturation and some percentage below saturation, you have the same curve as this, just you're kind of reversing upper and lower thresholds in the model. So again, and since crop has uh, uh, different sensitivities to water stress at different stages of crop, and do we need to adjust the shape throughout the season? So the the shape is constant. It will own depending on which stress threshold you're considering. It only so say there will be a different version of this for each different stress threshold. So say for the canopy expansion stress, there would be a different upper threshold, different lower threshold, different shape parameter. And obviously that then only affects the model in the canopy development period. If you're looking at, say, senescence, you have a different upper and lower threshold, different shape parameter. And the same for pollination, which then obviously only applies to, a, say, a 15, 20-day period, maybe in the middle of the growing season. So I mentioned that there's also the stress effects on harvest index that are a little bit more complicated. They're integrating a few different types of crop responses to stress. <coughs> One of the differences is also that water stress can have both positive and negative effects, depending on how severe it is and when it occurs. So we have that reference harvest index value, HI0. We can increase above that. We can also decrease below that. And the reason for that is because there's quite a lot going on in this picture, but we're basically integrating all those different types of stress effects that we covered in the previous bits that I've talked about. So if we have reductions in the rate of canopy growth early in the growing season, that may actually, for some crops, have a beneficial effect 
on harvest index because it promotes more of the biomass that is being produced to be transferred to parts of the crop that are going to be harvestable yield for us. Obviously, if we have a crop like maize, which is a grain crop, if we get water stress during the period of pollination, we're only the model is going to account for that and it's going to basically reduce the pollination of the crop and therefore potentially significantly reduce our harvest index. If we don't get any pollination occurring, our harvest index will be zero and we won't get any yield even if, even if there's lots of above ground biomass. And likewise, if we're reducing transpiration in that later period where we have crop yield actually being uh, developed and formed, that's going to have a negative impact on the harvest index. So depending on the different sensitivity of the crop to these different water stress effects, so when water stress is occurring, that's going to determine what the effect is on the harvest. <coughs> so the model is basically keeping track of what the stress was on each day of the growing season for each of the different growth processes, and then through a number of equations, integrating those together to allow us to adjust the harvest index during the growing season. Was there a question? No. So I, I mentioned that the other effect on harvest index is obviously if we cause our crop to die off earlier than it would have done if there wasn't any water stress, the effect is basically going to be that we can kind of cut off this curve and we just won't get to the end of it. We have less harvest for yield therefore uh, as a result. So that's basically how the model works in terms of crop development the simultaneous soil water balance and the types of adjustments we make for water stress during the growing season. There are some other types of stress effects that the model considers. Temperature stress is probably the most significant <coughs> of those. So when we have days that are very, very hot above some threshold level, which again is crop specific, our rate of biomass production is going to be reduced due to heat stress. We have days that are very, very cold, again, the threshold level depends on the crop, we're going to reduce our biomass production because uh, conditions are too cold for uh, unlimited growth to occur. And similarly, we can also adjust our harvest index parameter if we get uh, very high or very low temperatures occurring during the period where the crop is pollinating. So specifically for those fruit and grain producing crops that are very important in this part of the world, that's an additional effect that we're considering. The original aquaculture model <coughs> developed by FAO also looks at salinity and fertility stress effects. So salinity is considered through a separate salt balance in the root zone. Fertility stress at the moment is considered by just some simple uh, adjustments to the model. It's not actually uh, simulating the nitrogen cycle or any other types of nutrient cycle in the root zones. Again, that's an area that we're looking to develop a little bit more. These haven't been included in AquaCrop OS at the moment. We didn't quite have time to get them in before we released the code, but when the new version comes out in a month or two's time, we're gonna be building both of these in and also looking to develop the uh, fertility stress effects bit of the model a little bit further. And then just to sort of go through the different inputs that are required to run the model, you basically need to tell the model everything about the environment that the crop your simulating is being grown in. So you need to tell it what the weather conditions are at the upper boundary. So you need to tell it minimum temperature, maximum temperature, precipitation, and reference of evapotranspiration. So reference ET depends on a number of weather parameters. We will hopefully in around <coughs> six months time or so have a free open source MATLAB Octave toolbox that will allow you to basically take about 16 or 17 different reference ET models and just plug your own weather data into it and it will spit out the outputs for you to try and simplify that process. You also have to tell it the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. Again, you can then bring in different types of climate change scenarios um, into the models to account for that. Have to tell it things about the soil profile. So you can do that in one of two ways. You can either tell it what the textual characteristics of the soil are, so what the percentage of sand is, what the percentage of silt is, what the percentage of clay is, organic matter, and the model will run an inbuilt pedo transfer function that will convert those into the hydraulic properties of the soil, and you can specify different layers within the root zone um, if you have a non-homogeneous soil. 
or if you know what the hydraulic properties of the soil are, you can specify those directly um, as an input. And you also have to specify some general properties, um, particularly around how you divide up the soil into different layers and different compartments that controls that sort of cascading soil water balance. Probably then the most important is the crop characteristics. We kind of have a split between crop parameters that are conservative. So these are ones that FAO have developed and cal calibrated for specific crop types that are meant to be independent, independent of the location the crop is grown in or the types of management practices on the field. They may, however, vary depending on the type of cultivar that you're using, so some local calibration is sometimes necessary. And when we then have parameters that are more location or cultivar specific, so the depth of the root zone, the length of the different crop growth stages, and that's really where the calibration uh, comes in. One of the nice things that we've set up with the open source version is that you can run the model over multiple different years and specify a given rotation in the model. So you can specify that you want to run the model in year one for corn, then for soybean in year two, then another couple of years of corn, then maybe another year of soybean. Does the weather do a carbon balance for the crop rotation? No, it doesn't. So it's a water-focused model, so I don't think a carbon balance is something that we're going to build in in the near future. I think that probably is beyond the scope of this model. Yes, Chris. Since the model uh, uses uh, phytotransport functions yeah. for the water part, and does the model uh, distinguish between uh, uh, at least uh, two types of uh, soils in the, in the tropicals or not in the temperate region because one to one, one to two types of uh, clay minerals? And because of that, the, the, the hydrological properties are quite different between these two uh, types of soils, although they may have the same type. Yeah, so at the moment, the pedo transfer model we use is the one that the USDA folks developed, so the Saxton and Rawls yeah. model. Um, my recommendation is that if, that if you know that that transfer function model is not applicable to the area of the world that you're working in, that you do the calculation outside the model and then provide it the hydraulic properties as inputs uh, to the model. We could build in different types of pedo transfer model into the thing, but it's another input we have to set up and runs the risk that people get confused as to which one they're supposed to be using. So if you have your own field site, do you have any inverse parameter uh, estimates? So if you have your own time series of soil moisture and canopy cover and yield output, do you have an inverse procedure set up, or is that something you guys are thinking about? Don't, but it is something I'm thinking about, yeah. Uh, and again, one of the advantages of having it as something that we can manipulate mm -hmm. in an open source format is that we can, it will make calibration and optimization of parameters. How many total parameters are there? If you just have a homogeneous soil profile, you somewhere just between 30 and 50, is well that the soil of? profile? If you have a homogeneous profile of soil, how many, I guess, parameters are there total? For the soil condition? For everything. Soil, for everything. 30 to 50, is that sort of? Uh, I'd say probably in the, yeah, probably in the 30 to 50 range, because um, there's a number of parameters that really you don't need to change they're just they should be constant um, but yeah i'd say in the 30 to 50 maybe 30 to 60 range. i don't i don't have an exact number off the top of my head but okay yeah. so the other things we need to say is what are the actual management practices that are going on on the field so we have a field management input file so that is where you can specify things like if you have buns on a field, particularly if you were growing something like paddy rice, that might be significant. If you have any mulches on the soil to try and reduce soil evaporation, what percentage of the soil surface they're covering, how much they reduce evaporation by, if there's any tillage practices that need to be specified. And then there's a separate irrigation management file, which we'll be working with quite a bit today, which is where you specify basically when you're triggering irrigation, what's the rules for triggering irrigation, how's that water applied, so things like the application efficiency. When we have the salinity aspect into that, you'll be able to specify the salinity of irrigation water in that file. You'll see that there are basically three or four different ways of triggering irrigation in the model. You can do it based on the soil moisture level, and you can vary that trigger over the growing season to account for different sensitivities to soil moisture deficits. 
you can also specify it as say a fixed calendar that you know that you say you want to reproduce a field experiment and you know exactly what dates you irrigated on you can provide that schedule as an input the alternative is you can also specify it based on the number of days between irrigation events or you can have this net irrigation mode that effectively tries to maintain the soil moisture level at some specific specified value um, but the main ones really are around days between irrigation events and soil moisture triggers then have to give initial conditions so we can have soil water content at different points within the crop root zone and also if we want to consider a groundwater table what's the elevation of the groundwater table it is possible to start the model running before the start of a growing season so if you want to have a spin-up period to get your initial water content at the start of the growing season from the model you can actually start the model say at the say at the end of the growing season in the previous year and spin it up for six or seven months before you get to the start of the growing season and then we just have some really simple files that are just around the setup of the model so what ta what calendar time do you want to start the model at what calendar time do you want to end the model at that obviously has to match with your weather input data that you've provided and then just telling it what the names of the different files are that you've set up for the different inputs because you may want to change these file names around a little bit. So the fertilizer management is cons considered in the model? Not at the moment. So it it is in the original Aquacrop model, but it was when we released. So version 5 of Aquacrop has fertility stress and fertility management in the model, but it was sort of in a beta testing mode they've refined it quite a bit for version 6 so we've held off including it in this until we get the revised version in version 6 so at the moment there isn't fertility stress in there will be in two or three months time um, and that's probably one of the areas where we want to spend the most time trying to actually further refine and improve the model in the future how about any disease or weeds weeds again will be included in the next version that's Weeds are a part of the update for version 6. Uh, pests and disease are not, not included. I don't anticipate as included in those in the near future. Uh, Rob, you didn't really talk about Oh, yeah, sorry. I, I should have said when I was talking about the soil water balance that the rainfall is the rainfall net of any surface runoff, which is calculated using just the standard curve number approach. OK. Um, then how do you generate runoff? Is that just lost? It's the then system? just lost out of the field one of the things that obviously you could do with this is that you could potentially if you wanted to simulate at the subfield level you could have lots of different models for different areas of the fields and have some a procedure that would allow you to pass the runoff from one area of the field to the next store model so to speak um, or it could be fed into a hydrological model if you wanted to look at say how that then impacts stream flow at the catchment scale so yeah at the moment runoff is effectively assumed to be lost unless you specify that there's some kind of bonds on the field to hold that water in place at which point it's allowed to pond at the surface. Actually, but I, will, I think about the, the runoff, I hope it's a kind of a puzzle by this one. If you have a runoff from the leaf, water leaving the field, but uh, if the field is in the middle of the slope, then uh, the water may yeah. come from it. So how does that one uh, kind of... Uh, yeah, so because it's like most crop models, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, they're, they're point scale, so they tend to sort of treat the field as one entity. Um, I think if you want to capture those dynamics, you have to have a district. You have to run them all in a distributed way over the field, and then actually have a procedure for calculating how that water flows over the field and infiltrates down into other neighbouring parts of the field. Um, but it's something that could be easily done. Um, you would basically take the runoff output and provide that runoff output as an input to a second aquacrop that's of the next, I don't know what mm -hmm. discretization you might want, 10 square meters um, to the right or to the left. Um, so that's one of the things that you can do with this version is that it does allow you to run lots of different versions of the model simultaneously to each other. How about irrigation runoff under flood? Can you, can you do the same thing? Yes, yeah, so you can do the same thing with flood runoff. Um, you'd have to again have different yeah, uh, I think in terms of you'd have to have a separate hydraulic model of the land surface that was calculating how the water flowed down mm -hmm. through say a furrow 
um, from one end of the field to another. I mean, things like putting the soil bums in as a management input is going to be mm -hmm. important probably in uh, a flood irrigation system. Um, otherwise, you're obviously going to lose a lot of water to, exactly. to run off, which may or may not happen in the real world depending on what they're doing with it the happens. tailwater. It happens. <laughs> it does happen, yeah. <laughs> So yeah, one of the inputs to the irrigation management routine is the application efficiency. Um, so that's another way that you can build in differences between irrigation type and also specify the proportion of the soil surface that is actually wetted by irrigation to account for the fact that you may only wet part of the soil surface, particularly for something like drip irrigation. So that's basically the inputs that you have to provide the mop. You then hit run, the model will basically spit out a number of outputs. It will basically spit out four files, three of which are daily output files, which basically say what the crop growth was at the end of each day of a simulation period. So that's how deep was the root zone, what was the size of the canopy cover, how many growing degree days accumulated on that day of the season, what would the canopy cover have been if there'd been no water stress, likewise with the root system, what's the biomass production, what's the harvest index, what's the yield. Then gives you the water contents, and that's at every sink, both for the average of the root zone and also for every individual point within the soil profile. So you can, di you can divide up the soil profile as much as you like. You could have one centimeter thick compartments throughout the whole root zone if you wanted. Whatever that's meaningful, it would also take a lot longer to run if you did that. Um, and then you have a sort of water fluxes file. So what was the runoff? What was the deep percolation? What was the irrigation rate? What was the soil evaporation and crop transpiration rates? So on and so on. And then probably the one that we'll really look at today is this sort of final output file, which is just telling you on each growing season that you simulated, because you can simulate more than one growing season in one run, what was the crop yield? What was the amount of irrigation water that would be, had been used? We will add some additional inputs, uh, outputs to that file as we develop the model a bit further. It also tells you what date the crop was planted on, what date it was harvested on, um, so on and so on. So that's kind of the overview of the model, how it works, what the inputs are and outputs are. We have, I guess, 15 minutes or so more before the break. Uh, does anyone have any questions that we haven't covered so far? Um. I'm new to this area, so how extensive is the calibration across? <coughs> how many crops, how many validations and so on? It depends on the crop type. So certain crops have had a lot of testing. So maize has had a lot of testing, rice has like had a lot of... How much? Uh, maize are talking about probably 10, at least 10 plus sites in depth different areas of the world and for each site several years of field experiments. And there are lots of people independent of FAO who've done additional calibrations of the model. Where, I mean, if you type in aquacrop in the literature, you'll see there's lots of calibration papers um, and validation papers. Rice has also had a lot of calibration. Wheat has had a lot, as has soybean. Tomatoes has had quite a bit. And then there, there are a number of slightly more niche crops that are perhaps have been tested a lot, but only in one specific area of the world. So there's been quite a bit of work using the model for quinoa, but it's really been focused very heavily in a couple of countries in South America. Um, similarly, some smaller, <coughs> less widespread crops in Africa, like teff, have had some calibration, but perhaps not enough yet. So when was the start of that crop? So they released it in 2009. I mean, the development happened quite a lot, long time before that. Uh, it was really designed as a, so for those who are familiar, there was the FAO 33, which was the durham boston cassam equation that was basically saying that yield is a function of the actual evapotranspiration divided by potential evapotranspiration multiplied by some KY value that was basically like the sensitivity of the crop to water deficits in different periods in the growth conditions. And they basically felt that they got to a point where that was really outdated compared to current knowledge. But there were also lots and lots of crop models around that beyond the research community were very hard for practitioners to use because they maybe required 
100 to 200 parameters to be run an extensive calibration and often data to calibrate those parameters that simply wasn't available if you were, say, in the Ministry of Agriculture in Zambia and you wanted to calibrate your model for a specific type of local crop and you just didn't have the data to do that calibration. So that was really the motivation behind setting it up. So how do you compare this with the BSAT model? In it's terms very good. of parameters and in terms of the user community? I'd say definitely less parameters than DSAT. I say the user community is a little bit more skewed towards uh, decision makers and practitioners than academic researchers. I'd say Acroprop's quite split between academic researchers and people doing integrated modeling studies across bringing in, say, hydrology and economics, which is how we work mostly with it, and then, say, local ministries of agriculture, irrigation departments. Um, one of the things I'd very much like to do is to do a multi mod particularly for Nebraska. Um, I know there are people in the room who might be potentially interested in this, is to do a multi model comparison of aquacrop with DSAT, with hybrid maize, um, maybe with APSIM as well. Uh, particularly around the ability of the models to capture water stress effects uh, on what the because that could tell us a lot about how well we can actually predict impacts of water scarcity on agriculture and to what extent our model differences are perhaps more important than a lot of the other differences we consider. Is apple crop part of the underneath group? It is, yeah. So if they're still developing the AgMIP have a specific set of protocols that they want people to use for how the model integrates into that program. So they're still working to set up Aquacrop for that for that program, but it will be part of that, yes. Any other questions? The the crop cover concept is, is quite significant deviation yeah. from the What's the justification of using that instead of a communal divider index? The justification of the, uh, when the model was developed was that canopy cover is an easier thing to obtain data on to actually calibrate a model. You can't literally take a camera and look visually down and get an image in a couple of seconds that allows you to have an input parameter. I'm, I'm on the fence as to whether which of the two approaches actually works best. Because um, obviously we do have a problem with some of our the older field trials, the thing that tended to be reported was leak area index. But then when you work with uh, remote sensing data for index, uh, indices like uh, NEVI, they most times work with, uh, well at least related to leaf area index instead of for the physical coverage of canopy. Now how do you kind of uh, couple this uh, so there have been a number of studies that have basically developed relationships between leaf area index and, and canopy cover from remote sensing for the purposes of using remote sensing images. The original motivation there was really around the fact that the model was trying to get to particularly practitioner communities at the field level rather than necessarily at large scale systems. It's become something that can be applied at that scale, but in that sense, the ability to take quick visual images was really the motivation behind the canopy cover aspect of it. Um, at least from the validation and calibration that's been done, it does seem to reproduce, it does seem to be an effective way of calculating canopy cover development with a pretty small number of parameters. Any others? No. Oh, no. <laughs> yes, we'll take it. to the canopy cover, is there any standard procedure for Knowing these values, <coughs> if I have a new crop and I have to build all these parameter databases from scratch, how do I know? Is there a particular height where the camera must be, the resolution, or yeah? So the there is some in the documentation, some guides given about exactly <coughs> how you would take such an image. Um, so yeah, that's some of that is included on the sticks that we'll hand out in a couple of minutes. Uh, but I can also talk to you more about that. And in the break, if you like. Uh, I believe you mentioned the word economics a yep. few minutes ago. I mean, kind of <laughs> uh, where does that fit in here? So, <laughs> a lot of what we have done with the model, so 
I'm a hydrologist originally by training and I've done more and more economics <laughs> over the years. Um, I guess Tara and Karina can vouch for the fact that I just about, I don't crucify the field too much, I just about get away with it. Um, a lot of what we do is taking the outputs from the models, we build, build the crop water production functions, feed those into economic models mm -hmm. of yeah. farmer decision making, use that to study questions like how should water be allocated, what are the potential mm -hmm. economic impacts of policies across a heterogeneous landscape, a lot focused on as you reduce potential irrigation rates as an aquifer depletes, what's the right. lost value in production from that? And how does that differ compared right. to just simply the cost of pumping, pumping the water, water from great Maximizing that yeah. pr production yeah. response. I mean, production yeah. functions are a baseline input mm -hmm. to most exactly. ag economic analysis, so that's really the link. Mm -hmm. So what is the most sensitive parameter? What is, I guess, the least known parameter in the model, in your opinion? Depends on the production system that you're. That okay, you're, so that you're irrigated looking. corn in Nebraska. We're talking about irrigated corn in Nebraska. Um, I'd say probably the root system is probably one of the ones that we I'll like know less about, and certainly a lot of the. And that's the, very sensitive in the yield estimate. Well, it's well. quite yeah, it's quite sensitive because it affects exactly how much water is available to the crop and therefore how likely water stress is to be triggered in the model and also the root system is probably the hardest thing for us to actually calibrate if you can't get easy information about how deep the root system is, what the potential extraction rates were at different depths, whereas canopy cover you can observe canopy cover, biomass you can harvest a chunk of the field and you can calculate the biomass level getting a value of root depth and root system development to then feed in as a calibration is much, much harder. So when you calibrate a specific site, can you, can you talk about how, like, are you just calibrating it to uh, yield or soil water content profile? Or Ideally as much as is available. So um, what does the objective function look like then for multi-observation, you know, if it's it? The objective function would really probably be trying to re reproduce biomass. Okay, and the yield. time series of biomass is yeah. your main calibration. time series of biomass and then probably final yield at the end of the growing season. Okay. Um, if you have soil water content measurements as well, that can be fed in, although I think the majority of the studies that are done tend to focus on what's happening above ground and less on below ground. That's something that perhaps shouldn't be the case, mm -hmm. but it would be good to have more soil water balance estimates to better look at that. Part of the model. Um, certainly, again, something we want to do when we add, when we try and look at alternative soil <coughs> balance model. That, that cover. Yeah, I mean, there's a couple of nice MATLAB options out there. Yeah, he has so curve root. He has uh, Dream, which is a nice uh, yeah. large scale parameter estimator, and Sobol, which yeah, is a sensitivity so analysis. Those two things are nicely. Yeah, MATLAB coupled. having bringing in some of the MATLAB functionality around. At the moment, if you went to the original model, you basically just have to turn a knob, run the model, does it do a bit better, turn another mo knob, run the model, do a bit better, but this gives us a way of connecting to an actual parameter optimization and search space analysis. Mm -hmm. Can you run uh, the old version in a batch mode? So you can, you can run the old version in a batch mode, <coughs> it's terribly slow. Um, it runs in batch mode, but it runs basically just a batch of simulations. So one simulation runs when it's finished, simulation two starts. The advantage here is that you can set up, say, so I think I was making a poster on this the other day and I had, I wanted to run 10,000 different irrigation strategies <coughs> through the model. If I did that with the original version, I'd have to run 10,000 simulations one after another, whereas I could just pass it off onto our departmental cluster and run it in a few minutes rather than in several hours, potentially even a day or two with the batch model. So if you have access to the ability to run it on either on different clusters of a different cores of a single computer or on a large cluster, then you can significantly reduce run times if you wanted to look at lots of climate scenarios, lots of irrigation management practices, maybe you want to simulate production for the whole of the High Plains aquifer with gridded climate data and soil conditions. That's going to be much quicker if you can pass it on to a server. 
you also mentioned uh, CO two concentration is one of the things that people can play with, and we also know that uh, uh, the effect of CO two on C three plants and C four plants uh, are different. Now how does the model treat the effect internally? Yeah, so there's a parameter in the model that you can adjust to account to basically scale the effect of CO two concentration on the water productivity parameter, and that value does differ between C3 and C4 crops. Again, that's an area where it's very hard to calibrate that. We have some experimental data, but we're also not sure whether the experimental data is actually an accurate reflection of what will happen in an open atmosphere system or not. So one more question at the back. In respect to yield, it's been shown in so many researches that there is this effect of partial ozone drying, which is a type of deficit mm -hmm. emission. Mm -hmm. on what happens on the root zone with respect to abscisic acid which causes the partial it's a lot of complex stuff but it's been discovered that it performs better than the normal deficit irrigation mm -hmm. so is there any hope that in the future you might probably have a new version which considers all this partial ozone drying not just limiting the water, and the water general water stress which is just coming below the normal field capacity and what actually happens on the root zone with respect to this, um, partial closure of the summer's water Potentially, yeah. I mean, one of I think one of the things that we're kind of hoping, I think, a little bit with this is that unlike the original model where you have to go into a user interface and you just provide the inputs and hit run, this you actually have the code. So if you had some experimental data and you wanted to develop a new routine that builds a bit more complexity into the soil water balance, you could go and write a new routine into the model and incorporate it, and then do the testing and hopefully then write a paper and show everyone the results showing how it's uh, had a beneficial effect on models' ability to predict water stress effects. So we're hoping this will kind of open up, not just for us to do new things with the model, but for other people to add new things in and test it against their own field data to see what makes an improvement, what has no effect. Sometimes it might <coughs> make the model worse. Um, so yeah. We're basically providing it as a way of people giving people more flexibility to do what they want to do with them all. Can you use it to predict the crop growth in a greenhouse? How good it is? You could do, yes. I can't say I've tried. I'm not actually aware of many papers that have tried either. Um, one of the interesting things is that the drip irrigation component has mostly been, when it was developed, was mostly focused on uh, above ground drip systems. We are at the moment trying to get our hands on some experimental data from a company that works quite heavily with subsurface drip irrigation and help working with them to build in a new component for adding in subsurface drip systems into the model. Um, but yeah, in terms of the more general applications for greenhouse production. I haven't tried it myself and I'm not aware of many studies that have. Um, I'd be interested to see the results if you want to have a go. 